This is Gotham City. So is this. And this. And even this. There are many different versions of Gotham, just as there are different versions of Batman. One of the most beloved is the version by Christopher Nolan in his Dark Knight trilogy. A realistic vision of the character and city, one that takes them seriously. But after I saw The Dark Knight Rises in theaters, something kept bothering me. Well, a number of things bothered me, but one still bugs me to this day. This Gotham. After a lot of stylized, larger-than-life takes on the city, Christopher Nolan finally gave us something grounded and real. And then he changed it. To me, this was Gotham City. But this was not. For the 2005 film Batman Begins, director Christopher Nolan and his production team created a Gotham City that perfectly suited their goal of a superhero film set in a world believably like our own. It was constructed using a variety of locations, including sets built on sound stages, even for sequences that theoretically take place outdoors. Some miniature and model work also came into play, as well as fully computer-generated cityscapes. Locations for Arkham Asylum and Wayne Manor were found in England, and then all these pieces were joined together with footage of a real city. Chicago. For the 2008 sequel, The Dark Knight, not only was a much larger portion of the production shot in Chicago, the city in the final film appears largely unaltered, dropping most of the CG skyline enhancement as well as just using Chicago's existing elevated train. I'm from Chicago, and I'm very proud of the city's cinematic history. Because the majority of American film production happens in Los Angeles and New York, it feels like a treat to see a story being told in my hometown. I don't mean to make it sound like Christopher Nolan and his DP Wally Pfister were the first to shoot Chicago well. A lot of memorable films have used the city's locations to great effect. But Nolan made it look like this. As a Chicagoan, a lot of the fun of watching The Dark Knight was recognizing bits of the city. I can't help it. Daly Plaza, LaSalle Street, Upper Wacker Drive, Lower Wacker Drive, Navy Pier, the Twin Anchors Pub in Old Town. Nolan's first two versions of Gotham were different from each other, but they were both built around the same real city, my home city. So even though I felt a disconnect between the two versions, I was able to get over it. But this didn't happen with The Dark Knight Rises. This wasn't just a new version of Gotham, it was a completely different Gotham. For me, the change from Batman Begins to The Dark Knight was manageable because both cities had the same core. But The Dark Knight Rises doesn't use anything from the previous cities. Obviously, this is a personal gripe and it is totally appropriate for New York to finally get to stand in for Gotham in a movie, given that New York City has carried the nickname Gotham in real life for over two centuries. Nolan has also said in interviews that he based his vision of Gotham in large part on New York, even when he was making Batman Begins, none of which he got to shoot in New York. But having lived in both cities and being a nerd who loves world building, it's hard for me to believe that three different visions of what are ostensibly the same city all exist in a consistent story universe. For example, when Bane destroys the bridges over the Gotham River to keep out the military, it's an effective tactic if the rivers look like this, but it makes way less sense if the river looks like this. Christopher Nolan is a director known for the specificity of his tone and vision, so why would he create three films set in the same city, but actually set them in three different cities? Well, first, a bit of history. When Batman first appeared in the pages of Detective Comics number 27 in 1939, he was the protector of New York. Or maybe just Manhattan. Or was it Metropolis? It wasn't for another two years that the name Gotham City would be officially adopted, establishing the fictional city as a place distinct from any real location. This allowed the writers and artists to tell stories in a city that, in many ways, could resemble any major city, but wasn't representative of a particular city. The side effect of this was a city that creators could interpret differently depending on the needs of their story. And as Batman stories changed with the introduction of the comics code from dark and gritty crime stories to colorful and campy superhero yarns, 
Gotham was able to change with them. Today, this is one of the defining characteristics of the Batman and his universe. Just as Batman himself has been revised, reinterpreted, and reimagined, so too has Gotham. Because Batman, more than most superheroes, is inextricably linked to his natural habitat. Gotham City created Batman and is the continuing reason for his existence. On film, the interpretations have varied wildly. The classic camp of the 1966 film and TV series are matched by a bright and sunny Southern California Gotham. This is the fun Batman. The Batusi Batman. Tim Burton's 1989 film features a deco industrial gothic style, and then a more urban gothic style for the sequel, appropriate for a darker, more brooding caped crusader. And the Joel Schumacher films create a sort of blend of these two styles into something all new and unique, a kitschy Batman for the 90s. All these Batman, and more besides, can coexist because they basically don't connect to each other and the stories of one have no bearing on the others. In comics, things are a bit different. Batman is a part of the DC Comics multiverse. He has more than three quarters of a century of history, stories, and here's the big one, canon. Canon is very important to the world of comics and its fans. It's not just the stuff that happened in the past, it's the characters and stories that laid the foundation for the stories happening now. The ups and downs and twists and turns and all the emotions that come with, which imprint themselves into the living memory of the fandom. But here's the thing. Most Hollywood filmmakers don't care about canon. They don't feel beholden to the works in comics that came before, even if they borrow from them extensively. Filmmakers want to tell their own stories, to do their take on the characters and universe, that's why Joel Schumacher's films, though technically in continuity with Tim Burton's films, might as well be in completely different corners of the multiverse. Nolan didn't care about making a version of Batman that could fit into existing continuity, and he didn't care about building an evolving universe beyond the end of The Dark Knight Rises. Fortunately, given Batman's constant need to reinvent himself, like the Madonna of the DC Universe, he has a relationship with canon that is a little looser than his peers. Even though characters like Spider-Man or Wonder Woman do see periodic reinventions, we always tend to think of them in their iconic forms. But my favorite Batman might not be your favorite Batman, and even though our favorites are wildly different, they're all still Batman. This is how so many different versions of Batman can exist in the same universe without upsetting the canon and it follows that this is true for Gotham City as well. And this is what makes Batman a character so ripe for constant reinvention on film. Reinvention has been built into the character. It's no wonder filmmakers have returned to Gotham again and again over the years. I'm going to take a slight detour here and talk about a different city. The 2002 film City of God is a movie about a place. The drama that fills the lives of its many characters occurs over more than a decade, from the late 1960s to the early 1980s. The people we are introduced to as children grow into adulthood before our very eyes. And so does the City of God. We first see this suburb of Rio de Janeiro in its early form as rows of small homes set along unpaved streets literally just tiny houses plonked down in the dirt. But these are just seeds. Inside the homes are people with aspirations and dreams. Some want to rise above, others want to dominate. And as they make their moves, they rise, they grow, and they adapt. And in doing so, they affect each other, and they affect the city. They change the world, and the world changes around them. Tiny houses become apartment buildings, Dirt paths become asphalt streets, kids become adults, the innocent become the damned. And over time, we revisit the same spots in the city again and again. We learn its flaws and quirks just as we do with the human characters. Before our very eyes, the city begins as a child, grows through adolescence, and becomes an adult. Rise, grow, adapt. And the characters of City of God are tied to that place like Batman is tied to Gotham. Gotham isn't just a setting, it's a character. 
It's the second most important character in any Batman story. In most modern interpretations of the character, it's understood that Batman is the real character, and Bruce Wayne is the mask he puts on to walk around in the daylight. The opposite of most superheroes. But in Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, this is not the case. This is the story of Bruce Wayne becoming the Batman, being the Batman, and eventually giving up the Batman. What this Bruce Wayne wants to establish is Batman as a symbol against the darkness. He knows that he cannot end all crime within his own lifetime, so he wants to create something that can live beyond him. Bruce Wayne is a man with a dream, a life's work, and if you view these movies with that in mind, you begin to see them as the story of a great man's life. Bruce's father, Thomas Wayne, was a doctor who spent much of his multi-billion dollar fortune trying to unite the city and fight poverty. But high ambition casts a very long shadow. And given that Thomas and Martha Wayne were murdered during the height of the Wayne era, that shadow never had a chance to fade away. And this is the legacy thrust upon the young Bruce Wayne as a child. All that was expected of him was to get an education and grow up a little so he could continue his father's work. Bruce did grow up a little, but he grew into a very angry young man. Then he left town to get his education. People usually go to college for this, but Bruce had other plans. He found a mentor to guide him, who then turned out to be an asshole. It's okay though, because even though he didn't get a degree, he still graduated. But as anyone who has been out of college for a significant length of time will tell you, growing up doesn't stop at graduation. When you get out into the real world, a familiar emotion takes hold of you in a new and terrifying way. Fear. The world is big and scary and it throws a lot at you, but you learn to cope, you learn to deal, and maybe along the way you rise to the challenge and make a difference. But then it starts getting hard. Now Bruce is all grown up and having to deal with the complexities of real adult life. There are so many other people, so many moving parts. As Batman, Bruce is having a big effect on the city. Petty crime starts dropping, but organized crime gets more desperate, more violent. Black and white ideas of morality go out the window. And all Bruce can do is all any of us can do grow and make the best choices we can with the information we have. Sometimes your choices are good, and sometimes they're bad. And sometimes they're so bad you force yourself into early retirement. In the final act, Bruce is on sabbatical, but he cannot escape his old life and must return one last time. Age may have slowed him down, but this is no excuse. Life doesn't care if you're old. But it has to be him. After all the work he's put in, he is now, after all, the foremost expert in his field. But the new challenges overwhelm him. For eight years he'd left this world behind, and it changed while he wasn't looking. Thus, Bruce had to find a way to change with the times, to adapt. This is where Bruce finishes his life's work, the work of creating a living symbol for Gotham that will live beyond him, his own legacy outside the shadow of the name Wayne. And then he retires to Europe with his sexy new girlfriend so someone else can have the job for a while. The life of Bruce Wayne. Rise, grow, adapt. And rise. But of course, it's not just Bruce Wayne that changes. Okay, back to the city. Here's where I try and explain to myself as much as to you why I think we are meant to accept that fake Chicago, regular Chicago, and mostly New York can all be the same city. The Dark Knight films were never originally planned as a trilogy, which means that Nolan and company could tell each story on its own terms. As a result, the three films exist in three different genres. Batman Begins has the feel of noir about it. It's a Hollywood version of a film noir version of a comic book version of a city. We do get this one aerial shot to appreciate the scope of the city, but the buildings extend past the edges of the frame, a dark sprawl that may as well be endless. This is Bruce Wayne's city at the start of his journey. Vast, frightening, a caricature of a city but one that is still filled with people living their lives and needing to be saved. It's an imaginary city, one that can be fixed by a force for good like Batman. At least, that's what Bruce Wayne believes. When we're young and idealistic, this is how we see the world. 
It's ours, and what Bruce wants to do with his world is to save it. It's a mythic vision of Gotham for a mythic version of Batman. The Dark Knight, on the other hand, is a crime saga in the vein of Michael Mann's Heat. The Gotham of this film feels like a real place, and that's because it basically is a real place. And the real world pushes back. So gone are the computer-generated cityscapes, the Art Deco triple-decker elevated trains, and the gimmicky comic book villains. That's not what this Gotham is about. This is a Gotham of the mob, corrupt cops, and murder. This is Gotham City for grown-ups, with a healthy dose of reality and a little dash of chaos. So what was Nolan's approach to The Dark Knight Rises? Historical epic. At the start of The Dark Knight Rises, Bruce Wayne has been a recluse for eight years. While that's not really enough time for a whole city's skyline to change from this to this, it is enough time for the world to change. As we get older, we start to slow down, making the world feel like it's accelerating past us. Recently, with the expansion of the internet and all its related services, apps, and conveniences, the world is in many ways accelerating at an unmanageable rate. This is what has happened to Gotham in Bruce's absence. The presence of the Batman in Gotham City didn't stop crime. It made criminals more brash and more violent. And then with Batman gone, they were the ones who started changing the world around them. Not the street-level thugs, though. The capitalists. The businessmen. People like Bruce Wayne, but without the sense of morality that Bruce treasures. They twisted the city. Its skyscrapers and spires grew dense, its roots burrowed deep. The city became something different, something Bruce could barely recognize. It's so different, in fact, that Nolan chose to shoot it in another city entirely. Actually, several other cities. That's because this telling of a Batman story has a scope beyond Gotham. Not just because part of the movie takes place in a hole in the middle of a desert half a world away, but because Bane turns Gotham itself into a weapon. Rather than a story merely set within Gotham City, The Dark Knight Rises is a story where a city is turned against its country. This film isn't trying to play on the same level as The Dark Knight. It's going for David Lean-level epic storytelling. Three genres, three Gothams. And just as every Batman is still Batman, Every Gotham is still Gotham, whatever it may look like on the outside. Moving the Dark Knight films from Chicago to New York was not an accident or a decision made on a whim. It was a conscious choice that reflects the themes of the final film in the trilogy. Nolan created three different versions of Batman, or more accurately, a Batman at three different stages of his life. And then he used them to tell three very different stories and each of these stories had to be paired with an appropriate Gotham. Reinvention is part of Batman. Christopher Nolan just reinvented him slightly within his own franchise, as did Tim Burton. While I may not have loved the choice to switch real cities, it is still a valid one, and it falls in line with what many creators have done with Batman in the past. But more than that, it reflects an intention on the part of the storyteller to convey the evolution of the characters through the evolution of the space around them. The world of our real lives changes on timescales small enough for us to see. We watch our friends grow up and move away, we watch familiar corner stores close, and we watch as gentrification swallows up the old and replaces it with the new. Hell, the Chicago skyline I grew up with is not what it looks like today. We change, and the world changes around us. Rise, grow, adapt. Thanks for watching.